We're going to start with falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus.
take up this evening's offering with this next song that says, I got out, that I've been through the fire, but I got out. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I'm thankful that we got out, out of the world, out of sin. Amen. Out of bondage and addiction. I'm so thankful for what God is doing in our lives. And to see it happening week by week, it is just so fantastic to see all that God is doing all the time. And I remind myself, you know, as pastor, I've also got to deal with all the problems. And I can promise you any time that there is revival, there is growth, there's also problems. You can be seated, brothers. Thank you. Amen for your faithfulness. <laughs> See, they're not the problem. They're standing ready to go. Amen. But I got to step back and remember and realize that, you know what, there are problems, there are things that are going on, but in the midst of all that, God is doing amazing miracles day by day, week by week. What an awesome and extraordinary God we serve. Amen. And I'm thankful to serve him, thankful to be in his house tonight. We heard a great message from Sister Kayla this morning, and I'm thankful for that, thankful for what God did in Butch's life this morning and the work that he is doing. Amen. And that is one of those great miracles and testimonies that we are, I'm excited about, things that God is doing. Amen. And so I'm going to give you a few quick announcements here tonight and uh, we'll so on Tuesday night remember it is our small groups our light groups are going to be meeting and so meet here at 7 p.m. and if you haven't been involved come and get involved in one of those groups there's a lot of great things that are going on and great opportunities to be involved and then also later on this week 
We have got on the 22nd, we have got a seniors games night. That's at 630. And so uh, all of you that are seniors, you've got a get together here this week. On the 23rd Saturday, we have a ministry mentoring class once again. And so uh, prayer is at nine and then 10 o'clock will be the ministry class. Then also on the 23rd, there is a hyphen event. And so uh, remember the, the that for all that are a part of the hyphen group. Amen. Continue to pray this week. We still haven't gotten things resolved on our gas bill situation. We're waiting on an inspector to come, and uh, they've been slow in getting here. So just keep praying with me about that, that God will help us with that. I know that God's going to supply all our need, but I told him in prayer, I know that God will always help to pay the bills, but I prefer not to waste his money either. And so just pray that God will um, will help us with that. And uh, then remember a couple of other things that I want to keep before your attention. On the 24th, that's next Sunday, we're looking forward to great things in our services. Next Sunday night, we we are uh, is something that I have been. I'm looking forward to hearing. Brother Joe is going to be sharing his his testimony. It's something we've been doing in Renfrew that I, I really feel that will will bless hearts here. To and you know, there's things. Sometimes we we you come into church, and this is all the more true as the church is is growing. And uh, for those that are trying to do attendance right now, we have so many visitors, so many new faces all the time that it's hard to just kind of keep track of people, much less to to get to know them. But when you start to hear the testimonies amongst us of things that God is doing, it really does blow your mind. And, you know, not everybody looks for the limelight and is constantly looking for attention. But when you have an opportunity to hear what God has done in their lives, it truly is amazing. It's inspiring. And so we're going to do those periodically, but next Sunday night will be one. The following Sunday is Easter Sunday. Remember, invite four people to church for Easter Sunday. That is your challenge, amen. And if we will do that, if you'll just do that, I believe we're going to have our best attendance ever on Easter Sunday, two weeks from today. And then one other thing I want to just keep in front of you, and that is that on April the 13th, it's a Saturday at noon, Justin and Mandy will be getting married right here, and we are excited for them. Amen. Amen. And so uh, I, uh, I have to share this. You know, Jason Bellamy, he's away right now on vacation, and I've, I've told the story on Jason a few times. Early on when he was a, a young Christian, he came to me after one of these vacations. They had gone to a resort somewhere in the Caribbean, and he, he came bragging to me like, Pastor, he says, he says I, uh, I, I've been set free from alcohol. And, uh, and I was like, oh, Jason, that's, that's awesome. He's like, yeah. He says, I drunk so much that I never want to drink again. I've been delivered. Well, um, that wasn't the delivery quite that we were looking for, and the work would take a little longer after that, but uh, Ethan was sharing with me before church that, that Jay is such a changed man at this point that he is the one that is helping the guys that have been fighting with their girlfriends or their wives and taking them off to their rooms and uh, settling people down. He's like the wise elder there that people are coming to with their troubles, so... So, Jay, if you're listening tonight, hey, that's more of the testimony I'm looking for, buddy. <laughs> Amen. Isn't it great what God is doing in lives? Amen. Why don't you stand for the reading of God's Word here tonight? We're going to go to the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 36 and verses 24 to 28. I do want to honor uh, those who ministered while I was away. Thank you so much to both uh, Pastor Craig and Sister Macy, also to Pastor Nick for their good ministry during that time. I appreciate it very much. Amen. And keeping things steady, it was great to, to get uh, pictures of visitor cards and all the people that visited during the time that we were away. Amen. And so thank you for, for working hard during our absence. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 24 says, For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart, and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh 
and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. And this morning, Sister Kayla did a lot of the heavy lifting and establishing some of the, uh, the groundwork of where I want to go. And I'm going to go in a little bit different direction, but it is very unique and amazing to me, as so often happens, that God works in theme sometimes, and without any kind of coordination, God was talking to her about the heart. God was talking to me about the heart. And tonight, I'm going to talk to you on the subject, a heavenly heart transplant. A heavenly heart transplant. Let's go to the Lord right now. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray that you would anoint your word here tonight. God, that you would speak into the need of this service right now. God, the people that are here, God, you have a work to be accomplished here. And I pray, oh God, that you would have your way, that you would anoint your word and anoint our understanding. Uh, to hear, to understand, and to respond, I pray, O oh God, uh, Lord, that you would have your way in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can be seated here tonight. The Genesis 4, this message, is something that's been kind of percolating for a while. I made a note on this, this subject about <clears throat> excuse me, six or seven weeks ago. Then earlier this week, I was reading another article that delved into studies that are bringing out some really surprising outcomes from things like blood transfusions and organ transplants, and in particular, when it comes to heart transplants. One of those major new studies comes out of the University of Colorado School of Medicine and has been published in the medical journey Transplantology. It was published on January 17, 2024, so very recently. So this study, it's been examining kind of a trend that had been observed some in the past, but there's been a little bit more focus on this unique thing that is happening as transplanting has become all the more common over the last number of decades. And the, the kinds of organs that can be transplanted has obviously grown. And so as a byproduct of that, at first everyone is just kind of caught up in the wonder that you can take the organ from a, a donor, be it a living donor or a, a donor that has recently passed away, and then that you can take that and transplant it into the, the body of someone who is failing or has already that organ has failed, and you can help to prolong and preserve their lives. And, of course, that in itself is utterly amazing. And, and at first, that's what all the focus is on. Now that we're having a little bit longer-term uh, opportunities to study what is happening in these situations, this particular study that I'm referencing begin to dive into what is a unique and uh, unexpected side effect of transplants, and in particular when it comes to heart transplants. They found that 89% of the people in their study experienced a change in their personality following a transplant surgery. Other studies have found similar results to varying degrees, but this is the most focused of studies of this kind. And I'm going to read you directly a paragraph right out of the study itself. I'll just read you one paragraph because studies tend to be a little bit dry by their nature. But it says this, Many different types of personality changes have been described following organ transplantation. These include changes in preferences for food, music, art, sex, recreation, and career. The experience of new memories, feelings of euphoria, enhanced social and sexual adaptation, improved cognitive abilities, and spiritual or religious episodes. These changes were generally described as neutral or positive. However, troubling changes have oft also been reported. As many as 30 to 50% of heart transplant recipients experience emotional or affective issues, while others experience delirium, delirium I should say, depression, anxiety, psychosis, and sexual dysfunction. To give you a few of the anecdotes that have come out of this particular study, there's one woman that as soon as she was released from hospital after her heart transplant, she found herself driving immediately to KFC 
because she was craving chicken nuggets. And, uh, and she had this really strong urge and desire for chicken nuggets. And, and later on, when she was going back in a follow-up appointment and, and talking to the, the doctor, she discovered uh, that the, the man from whom she had received uh, the, uh, the transplant of the heart, actually, chicken nuggets were his kind of obsessive favorite food. And in fact, he died in a, a motorcycle accident. And in his backpack, he literally had chicken nuggets with him at the time. She had never craved them before, but after the transplant, she developed a new craving. There are others that have experienced memories that were from the donor, not themselves. There was a college professor in their 50s that had a, received a heart from a police officer in their 30s that had been shot. And, uh, and so that, that, that college professor, all of a sudden, he began to have memories of, of the moment in which he was shot, except for it wasn't him that had been shot. Obviously, it was the police officer, and even burning sensations where the wound took place. Uh, in another instance, there was a boy only five years old that received a heart uh, from a three-year-old boy that had been... Uh, that. Previous to this, this this boy, that the five year old, the living that received the donor, he all of a sudden had an aversion to Power Ranger toys. And it was discovered that the three-year-old boy, he had actually been reaching for a Power Ranger toy out the window on the windowsill and had fallen to his death. And all of a sudden, this five-year-old boy who had once played with those toys uh, had an extreme aversion to them after he had this. In some cases, some people that have never before been religious all, all of a sudden had uh, religious urges. And, and there are just impacts in various ways. And the question at this point, is what's causing this? And the truth of the matter is that no one knows for sure. But there are educated guesses. One of those guesses is that the body stores some things like memory or personality traits in organs almost like we would use external memory drives. And that's particularly true of the heart. And to be more efficient in storage in the brain, the brain actually will use and, and either through um, kind of uh, organic uh, signals that are sent through uh, one form or another to kind of offload some, to make space in the brain to offload some of that to various organs. And they can be uh, kind of accessed as needed, as much as you would use like a flash drive. And another similar theory is around the body's electromagnetic field, but and in a similar fashion that the body is storing information electromagnetically rather than chemically. And when you add an organ to a new body, it that information can be stored into the electromagnetic field of the new body. Some people obviously ascribe some kind of, of religious or spiritual uh, uh, cause for that, but the point is, is that the study found that while about 54% of other type organ transplants reported some kind of change after their transplant, nearly 96% of heart transplant patients reported a change in personality. Now, the science is still new here, but it seems fairly conclusive that a new heart comes with more than just a new physical organ. The Epoch Times reports life-saving organ transplants can, in some cases, lead to profound personality changes and what seems to be transfers of memories from the deceased donor to the living recipient. With that in mind, is it any wonder that David prayed this after his sin with Bathsheba. He said in Psalm 51 and 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You see, David recognized he needed more than just a second chance. Uh, he needed more than just a little bit of grace and yet another opportunity. He needed a change of heart. Uh, he recognized that there was something that was fundamentally broken with him, within him. Uh, it wasn't by accident that he had fallen into sin with Bathsheba, but rather as we heard this morning, uh, that there is uh, from the very heart stems all of these things, uh, 
And the problem was not the accessibility of Bathsheba. The problem was with, with something that was wrong with David, uh, wrong in his spirit, wrong in his heart. Uh, and so he, recognizing that, cries out to God, uh, God, uh, create in me a clean uh, heart. Uh, I need a change of heart. Uh, I need a fundamental change to my very nature. Uh, so I stopped doing what led me to this moment. The evidence says that people, for the most part, don't change. They try for a while, but then they tend to revert to the mean. And if you don't understand what that phrase means, they go back to being who they have always been. This is proven every January when so many people make New Year's resolutions that they invariably don't continue to keep. They have good intentions, and those intentions last for a very brief period of time. They make change, but the change is only temporary. And then they revert back to who they were before. That's not to say that people can't make radical change, but often it takes a cataclysmic event to fuel it. A very major health scare, for example. And, you know, there are people that maybe have tried to quit smoking, for example, and they've done that for decades. But all of a sudden, when they have a, a, heart, a heart attack or they have some kind of, of major health scare, and it's enough to kind of shock them out of the pattern and to where they actually follow through and they change. But for the most part, most people in most situations, uh, their good intentions just don't last long enough. Uh, and so they will try for a little while, and then they revert back to the old pattern. Uh, they will make changes, but those changes are temporary. Uh, and that leads to a defeatist mentality for many of us that are looking for transformation in our lives. Uh, we look back at our own history, uh, and we say, I've tried it before, and I've failed. Uh, I know me too too well. I know that I can't really change. I can try for a little while, but then I'm going to just go back. I'm going to fall back into the same pattern. I'm going to go back to the old habits, to the old sin. And so often before we even try again, we give up. People don't change. I can't change. But I want to offer you some new hope this evening. I see leading up to our text passage in Ezekiel, there's a history that Israel had gone through. And you talk about a people that kept reverting to the mean. They would try. They would have a righteous king, a prophet, a judge that would come along. I just am about to finish up the book of Judges in my daily Bible reading. And you see this pattern from very early on in Israel's history. In fact, you can go back a step further the nation has just been formed. They're just getting into the land of promise. Joshua challenges them. Choose you this day who you will serve. There can only be one God. Either you got to go back to the gods of our, our forefathers, back to, to Abraham's parents, or you've got to choose this day who you will serve. And the people said, we're going to serve, we're going to serve Jehovah. We're going to serve Yahweh. But the Bible says that that determination lasted literally as long as, as Joshua passing away and then the elders who were his contemporaries. And when they passed away, off to idolatry the people went. And then you read the book of Judges. It's the same pattern over and over. They get into big trouble. They cry out to God. God raises up a judge. And for the lifetime of that judge, no longer, as long as there's a spiritual leader, the people will come back to God. But then immediately they will revert back to their old ways. We see that carry on into the time of the kings, that so long as there was a righteous king, the people would turn their hearts to God. But it didn't matter how righteous he was, how many changes that he made. As soon as he passed away and a wicked king came along, the people had no problem. Uh, sliding back into paganism, uh, into the old ways. And there's this schizophrenia. They are one extreme to the other. Uh, they're serving Yahweh with all of their hearts. Uh, and then they're offering their kids up to Molech. Uh, they're going from uh, uh, being a one God people uh, to being pagans with all kinds of polytheistic worship. Uh, they go from one extreme in their behavior uh, when it comes to their morality to the other. Uh, they go from one extreme uh, when it comes to uh, the things that they celebrate and the things that they value 
back to another. They try for a little while, but they keep just reverting back to where God finally has to deal with them because of the sum total of their actions and follow up on what he warned them that he would do. And off they go into captivity. And so the book of Ezekiel is written to the people in captivity that are are soon to return back to the land of Israel. And God says to them, I know it's been this cycle, this frustrating, perpetual cycle. You feel like you cannot change. You know, they had, at times, they had the will. They made their New Year's resolutions, but they lack the ability to permanently change. But God says, I'm going to do something a little more radical with you this time. I'm going to do a heart transplant in your lives. We read in Ezekiel 36 and 26, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I want you to note this this language here. It's really interesting. In fact, we're going to read it one more time from the New Living Translation. It says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. I want you to note it's very interesting that God says that in the process of this heart transplant, uh, it's not just the change in the organ, uh, but rather God says, I'm going to put a new spirit in you. Uh, There's something about this that's going to cause a personality change. Uh, When I give you a transplant in your heart, uh, there's also going to be a transplant in your spirit. Uh, There's going to be a new way that you think, uh, a new way that you respond. Uh, There's going to be a transformation in you uh, that's going to keep you Uh, from slipping back again and again into the old ways. Uh, You may feel frustrated. Uh, You may feel like you can never change. Uh, But God says, once I have done uh, a work in your heart, uh, there is something that's going to change all over you. Uh, You will be transformed. Uh, And just as this study is exploring, uh, God says there's going to be a personality change that comes with this heavenly heart transplant. In recent months, I've had Things like a former biker enforcer sitting in my office and wondering why all of a sudden uh, he feels emotional and feels like he wants to cry uh, in God's house. Never cried throughout his life. uh, And all of a sudden uh, there's a tenderness that has come upon him. Uh, There's a responsiveness, uh, something that's soft. Uh, Well, God says, I'm going to take out uh, that stony and stubborn heart, uh, and I'm going to give you a tender, uh, responsive heart. Uh, God is doing a heart transplant, uh, and there's a change in personality. Uh, I've had young people sit in my office just in the recent months uh, and tell me how that not long ago uh, they wanted nothing to do with God. Uh, they had zero interest in God. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, they, they don't understand it, uh, but they desperately want to be at church. Uh, they turn on uh, their, uh, their music, and all of a sudden they want to turn it off, uh, and they want to listen. Uh, they said, I've never wanted to listen to Christian music ever before. Uh, but all of a sudden, that's the only thing uh, that I'm comfortable listening to. Uh, They'll talk about how feeling convicted, uh, about things that they used to do and didn't think twice about, uh, things they used to wear uh, and never thought twice about, uh, but all of a sudden there's a transformation. Uh, There's a personality change uh, that comes uh, when God does a heart transplant uh, in their lives. Another new Christian just uh, a year ago was talking to my wife and I uh, and talking about how and they, they would look at things in their closet uh, and they would just be shocked and think, uh, I used to wear that out in public? Uh, what was wrong with me? Uh, and that's not something that they thought about or contemplated intentionally. Uh, but when God did a heart transplant, uh, there's a personality change uh, that is coming over them. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the old you could not change. You could not have wished that change upon yourself. But when God does a heart transplant in you, everything changes. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have uh, become new. Uh, tonight, I offer hope to you. Uh, you can change. Uh, and it's not going to be through your will uh, or just trying harder. Uh, but you can be transformed uh, through a heavenly heart transplant. Uh, it's not about you finding an iron will. Uh, but it's rather about you becoming tender before God uh, and saying, God, uh, I'm ready for for you to transform me. But I want to go one more place here tonight. You see, whether we're talking about our original nature or about this transplanted personality I'm talking about tonight, you have to understand that it's not that you are some passive prisoner in this process. We can talk about our personalities, our character traits that we either inherited or were nurtured into us. And people will say, well, I have no control over that. It's just who I am. St. Patrick's Day today, you know, people will talk about, well, it's my Irish temper. I can't do anything about it. It's just marked on me. It's who I am. But here's the thing. That's not going to work. It's not going to cut it when it comes to God. Because God didn't create you as a slave to your programming. He created you with the power of choice. There are plenty of things within my personality, my nature, that you wouldn't like very much if I let out. There are things that I have to continually overrule within me that are a part of who I am. Appetites that are destructive or sinful. And I have to use my reason, my will, with the help of the Holy Spirit to choose the right things and to reject the wrong. And even the Apostle Paul talked about that as being a daily struggle. He says, I die daily. What he was saying when he makes that statement is that there is a will within him. He called it the old man, that carnal nature that wants to do all the wrong things and has no appetite for the good. And there is a daily fight, a daily struggle where there's a choice where Paul says that old man has to die and tomorrow he's going to have to die again. Why does this have to keep happening? Because that nature is there. It's a part of us. So when God puts a new heart in us, we do get a new personality. But we have to choose to allow that nature to flourish. Let's say myself, going back to the natural illustration I'm using tonight, I'm a preacher's kid. I've never had a drink of alcohol in my life. Let's say I had a transplant and it happens at that organ, unlikely, but because part of being an alcoholic is your organs aren't all that great for transplant. But we'll just say theoretically that I got a transplant from someone who had been an alcoholic. And all of a sudden, there is this inclination towards alcohol in me. Now, you could say, well, that's, that's something new. I just got to do what I got to do. Or you would say... Knowing who I am, I have to make a choice that, no, that is not going to become a part of who I am. I'm making a choice. So the point I'm making is that it's not that I'm forced to become that new thing. There may be a draw towards it that wasn't there before, but I've got to make a choice that I'm not going to allow that to rise up within me. So I want to flip that and talk from the heavenly perspective tonight. Because when God puts a new heart in us, we do get a new personality. And what I mean by that is, I've already kind of referenced through some of these anecdotal uh, accounts of, of all of a sudden there is a de desire for, for righteous things, for the things of God. Uh, you may have, have never had a desire to open the Bible before. In fact, many a time I have had people that have come to God who have said, you know, at one time I opened the Bible and it just made zero sense to me. I, I immediately put it down. I thought, what a waste of time. Uh, but all of a sudden when they've had a heart transplant, uh, 
all of a sudden their nose is in God's word and and it's alive and it's speaking to them. That is something that God has put into them that wasn't there before. It's a new personality trait. But the difference is, is that they are not some kind of manic addict that, that can't put the Bible down, you know, and if they don't, they'll get the shakes. Oh, I've got to read another chapter. They don't have to get a fix because they're addicted, because they are controlled by something that's going on. But rather, there is a draw, an inclination towards that, a hunger for that thing. But you still have to make a choice to seek after that, to feed that in your life. You may have a draw towards holiness in a way that you didn't before, where you want to dress different and you want to act differently. But you've got to feed that in your life because Otherwise, uh, the Spirit may prompt, uh, but you are not going to be changed if you don't allow it to happen. We have to choose to allow that new nature to flourish. We talk often about the importance of speaking in tongues as the initial evidence of the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And that's important because that's a biblical concept. Throughout Scripture, we find that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they, sp- they spake with tongues. They spoke in tongues. And I, I particularly like, in, um, I believe that it's in Acts chapter 10, when the Bible talks about the house of Cornelius, that the observers there, that they knew what had, had taken place because they heard them speak with tongues. So it was that evidence that Scripture talks about for us. But the point I want to make right now is that while speaking in tongues is the initial evidence, initial, initial evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the ongoing evidence of the Holy Spirit is what Scripture calls the fruit of the Spirit. And it ties into what I'm talking about right here. The Bible says in Galatians 5 and 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You see, these are new personality traits that probably were not dominant traits in your life before Christ. You probably weren't as loving as you should have been or as joyful as you should have been. It probably wasn't always peace in your life and in your relationships You may not have been very long-suffering at all. Long-suffering means the ability to to put up with a lot without getting triggered. You probably weren't as kind as what people would like you to be. Not as good. Not as faithful. Not as gentle. And certainly before Christ, we were not good at self-control at all. The Bible says that after you have got this heart transplant. There's a new personality that's trying to exert itself in your life because the heart transplant that God gives us, it's a transplant of his own heart into us. It's God putting himself in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so Jesus, when you have been filled with his spirit, Jesus is on the inside and he's trying to work on the outside. And so you feel a draw towards things, towards personality traits that you didn't have before. And in fact, John writes about how that day by day uh, we're being transformed into his likeness. Uh, If you allow Jesus to do the work, uh, every day that passes uh, you start to look a little bit more like him. Uh, Not so much in your physical features, uh, but in your character, uh, your personality. uh, Because with that new heart, uh, there's personality that wants to begin to, to come out in your life. We will have a changed personality in that we will feel a tug towards these things, towards change. But you have not been possessed by the Holy Spirit. What I mean by that is that your own will has not been overridden by God. But rather God leaves you with that power of choice. He will lead. He will prompt. But you've got to make a choice what you're going to follow. I love Romans 8 and 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not, or do not walk according to the flesh, but according to 
the Spirit. The Spirit's going to lead, but we have to choose to follow. There are going to be some godly instincts in your life that weren't there before your heart transplant, but you've got to choose. If I have been Spirit-filled for a while, and I'm not changing, then something is wrong in the process. Because the Spirit that God places within me, that Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, Jesus said in John 14. It's speaking truth into your heart. That personality change is because it's the change of right. And God's prompting. But somehow I have aborted the process in my life to where the Spirit speaks, the Spirit leads. But I'm not following. And sometimes it is just the stubbornness of my own will. People are in their minds, consciously or subconsciously, saying, I've already set boundaries of how far I'm going to go. Be careful when you put limits on God. People come to an apostolic church like this, and they say, well, there's things that I'm willing to do, but I'm never going to do that. <laughs> well, good luck. Good <laughs> luck. See, sometimes I'm actually robbing myself of what I could have in Christ because I have put constraints on where this new personality is going to take me. It's stubbornness. I'm not going to be changed. But of course, if you didn't need to change, you wouldn't have needed God to begin with. And I don't want to be the one to try to dictate to God, okay, God, I've made an assessment. Here's where you're okay to tinker because I could use a little work there, but I'm fine here. I'm all good. Very likely, the things that I'm saying I don't need to change in are the places I need to change the most. And so there is fruit that is shriveled on the vine. It's not flourishing and becoming what it should be because I'm not allowing the Spirit to lead into that area. We heard the importance about allowing God to search our hearts this morning. But tonight, I'm going to invite you to build upon that beginning. And I believe that this morning we heard about the importance of allowing God to search and to identify what's in us that needs changing. And tonight, I want to invite you with me to say, God, I want your spirit to be activated. This personality change, I want it to be activated. I want it to be sped up in my life. We all go through our own process. We have our own speed and your goal is not to become like someone else. But often, for just about all of us, we could be growing more than what we are. And very often it's because we have put limits on what God's allowed to do or not do in our lives. But David cried out, Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew in me a right spirit. God, I recognize I need that personality change. God, I may be the king. I may even be a man after your own heart. But there's something that is still broken inside of me. God, I need you to change my heart and my stony heart to a new and a tender heart. God, give me the willingness and that fresh desire that maybe I had when I was a new convert that was just desperate for more of you. I wasn't putting limits on you. God, but I was saying, Lord, I want everything you have for me. God, I want you to create that first love within my heart once again, to renew in me that desire, Lord, to just have more of you. Lord, wherever you want to work, however you want to do it, I want what you have for me in my life. Will you stand with me tonight? It's time for a heavenly heart transplant here tonight.
God, I want all the personality change. I know in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. But Lord, in you is everything that I need. And I'm going to invite you to come and invite God to do that heart transplant. Uh, all day long, we've been hearing about the importance uh, of letting God into our hearts. Uh, but tonight, I want you to pray uh, for the fruit of the Spirit to be activated in your life. Uh, God, uh, I don't want, Lord, my fruit to shrivel on the vine. Uh, but, Lord, I want to be fruitful for you. Uh, God, I want more of you and less of me in my life. In Jesus' name.